Welcome to Building Up Europe's Green Deal for Sustainable Recovery here at the World Economic Forum Sustainable Development Impact Summit. My name is Sarah Kelly. I'm a TV news anchor and a journalist. I host the main international news and the top political interview program, Conflict Zone, on Deutsche Welle TV in Berlin. And I'm really thrilled to be your moderator. The central question that we are looking at today is how can business and government use the European Green Deal to make the region greener, more competitive, more inclusive. To that end, we will hear about the ongoing work of the CEO Action Group for the Green Deal and the Regional Action Group for Europe and Eurasia to accelerate implementation of the green transition. But first, we have the great honor and the great pleasure of being welcomed to this session by the Executive Chairman of the World Economic Forum, Professor Klaus Schwab. Thank you, Anne. Uh, 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 it's a great meeting in the context of our Social Development Impact Summit, which actually uh, we will conclude later today. And this meeting uh, brings together two of um, essential communities um, working together with the Forum. The first one, the CEO Action Group on the Green Deal, and um, I want to welcome all the distinguished members joining us today, but particularly uh, Feike, Sibesma, and uh, uh, Thomas Bubel as the two members of the Board of Trustees uh, of the World Economic Forum. And of course, we are also joined by the members of the Regional Action Group for Europe of the World Economic Forum. This is a group which uh, was set up when the pandemic um, broke out in order to define together in a public-private effort uh, recovery strategies and also to design the great reset for the post-corona era. Um, the forum, as you know, is uh, uh, the International Organization for Public-Private uh, Cooperation so I'm very pleased to see the public dimension very well represented by uh, Minister uh, Gonzalez, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation of Spain. Um, she's also a member of the regional group, action group, and um, uh, His Excellency Minister van Veldhoven um, from uh, the Netherlands. Um, the President of the European Commission, um, of course, has shown uh, a strong commitment and, um, uh, and has outlined um, in her speech uh, how to implement the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. Let me just say and conclude with one word. The Forum is now mobilizing all its stakeholder groups. It's a big effort um, to be behind the Great Reset. And all our work will be devoted to the uh, Great Reset. But what I hope is that Europe acts really as a pioneer and as a big mover in this effort to, some would say, to build back, back better. We would say to really have a Great Reset and to define more resilient, more inclusive, and more sustainable strategies. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Professor Klaus Schwab, um, for that really inspiring opening for our conversation. Europe as a pioneer, we're going to talk about um, how that can be brought to fruition. Um, let's begin with our conversation, building up Europe's green deal for sustainable recovery. Um, you're going to see a screen appear um, on your screen right now because we're using the tool Slido so that you can submit your questions and take the poll that we are putting forward, which is how optimistic are you that Europe's recovery will be green? You go to slido.com, you enter SDIS, or you can click on the QR code on your screen. I would also like to invite all of you to please put your videos on and your mics on mute during our conversation unless you have been called on. Without any further ado, please allow me to introduce our distinguished panel. Minister Arancha Gonzalez Laya is Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union, and International Cooperation of Spain. Minister Stenta van Veldhoven is Minister for the Environment of the Netherlands. 
Faika Sibisma is the honorary chairman of Royal DSM and the co-chair of the CEO Action Group. And Thomas Bobel is CEO of AXA and a co-chair of the CEO Action Group. And, and Faika, I'd like to begin with you just to set the stage for us as we head into this conversation over the next hour and a half and, and also the breakout sessions that we will have thereafter. We mentioned the CEO Action Group. Uh, we heard Professor Klaus Schwab mention it. You are the co-chair. You're also engaged in a number of groups at the forum which focus on implementing the green transition. As executives in the private sector, the message is that you're up to the challenge, you're willing to cooperate with the public sector on Europe's Green Deal. You came out with an action plan this week. What can it achieve? Thanks, Sarah. And indeed, co-chair together with Thomas uh, and with great of the WEF, of course. Uh, well, we all know, like Professor Swap was saying, uh, we are uh, uh, dealing with COVID and we need to get out of the COVID crisis at a certain moment. My biggest concern, uh, if the impact of COVID uh, would be uh, the inequality in countries and between countries. Uh, we need really to use this as a new way of looking to capitalism, more stakeholder balance, more long-term balance. And an next pandemic, climate change, we can never say that we did not see that one coming. So therefore, we need to address climate change right now and not to park it in this COVID period, but to address it even stronger. This was already there before COVID, but I think it should be stronger and not less uh, in this COVID period. When did the companies who united 30 companies now in this uh, uh, group uh, um, uh, led or guided or helped by Thomas and myself, those companies want to support the European Commission with the Green Deal. They believe that the technologies and that their actions can help to make us to a net zero emitter. Uh, we believe uh, that the technologies can help to have economic growth and to create jobs. And of course, the companies are concerned about their own activities as well about disruptions on their supply chains or their physical locations or their employees uh, really wanted or their customers or the markets in which they operate. Um, and for sure, increasingly also uh, the investors. So what did we did? We took transport and mobility. We took the food and agri sector. We took the energy sector and say, hey, how can we support that with concrete actions uh, in those uh, areas uh, and then you can think about how do we reduce our emissions? How do we can implement a price on carbon? Uh, how we can create more transparency, uh, TCFT based? How we can even rescale people into green jobs who might lose the jobs in the current uh, period? Those kind of things to really use the Green Deal to create a better world uh, and to continue to create prosperity. And that's what we are trying to do with this group. Now 30 companies, I hope 100 soon. Okay, and you have a number of lighthouse initiatives. Um, perhaps a little further in the conversation, you can tell us a little bit more about that because I mean, this is, this is not just about talk. Um, this is very much about action, this yeah. particular initiative. Um, but first I'd like to turn to the foreign minister of Spain, Minister Gonzalez, um, and ask you um, about the fact that, you know, Professor Schwab has emphasized the need to work together as communities toward common goals, um, the need to, to, to mobilize stakeholders at this point in order to achieve this pioneering moment for the European Union. Um, we also know that the CEO Action Group is coming together with a regional action group for Europe and Eurasia, where there are high level leaders from politics, such as yourself, academia, business, et cetera. Through that lens and as foreign minister of Spain, how do you see the momentum right now to reset Europe's economy and put it on a greener path? And how encouraged are you perhaps by what you are seeing? Well, I'm seeing an incredible moment uh, right now uh, to do three things and to use this terrible pandemic uh, to accelerate uh, the transformational uh, moment in our economies towards uh, decarbonization, to do this uh, in a partnership uh, with the private sector uh, and to do this with a truly European dimension. In Europe, uh, the 
political support, the legitimacy uh, for climate change is there. It was vastly demonstrated in the last European Parliament elections, in the rise of the Green parties all across Europe. Uh, and uh, therefore, what we now need is to accelerate uh, this uh, movement that was already there uh, in the form of a European Union Green Deal, use uh, the recovery post-COVID uh, uh, to accelerate the change. This is certainly what uh, Spain uh, is advancing, both in the European Union as well in, as in our own country. For us, it's a very uh, simple matter. We first have to make sure this is uh, part of our legislative work. Uh, we have to have a plan, and this is where we've put in place uh, uh, plans uh, for uh, energy and climate change, a plan on the circular economy, a strategy for uh, an economy that is competitive, but it's also decarbonized uh, and helps us reach this goal of net zero by 2050. So first is planning. Second is uh, setting very clear goals and indicators that will help us measure how uh, fast we are approaching uh, this target. Uh, number three uh, is uh, giving ourselves the means. Number four is working with the private sector in a big public-private partnership. Uh, private sector will be essential in achieving this goal. And the last uh, element in our own strategy towards uh, this uh, decarbonized Spain in a decarbonized Europe that is doing this in an inclusive manner. We should never forget that behind this effort, uh, we need to ensure we leave no one behind, we leave no small business behind, we leave no uh, citizen or worker uh, behind. So inclusiveness would be um, a big component uh, of how we move towards this uh, greener Europe, but with full political support uh, in Spain, uh, in a European Union that has big legitimacy uh, to move in this direction. There, there was a lot in there, and I'd like to pick apart um, some of what you said and perhaps get Thomas to respond to it. Um, you talked about accelerating change. Um, you talked about um, having that change being inclusive. You talked about goals, indicators, about having a plan. Thomas, um, what do you see as the role of, of the private sector in those, those, those public-private partnerships? Because you're also co-chair of the CEO Action Group that we mentioned. Um, talk with us about the financial tools and the policies required to drive the green recovery? Because the commission is currently estimating that the Green Deal objectives, they need about 260 billion euros of additional investment each year until 2030. There's a sustainable finance strategy being developed. How do you see the role of the private sector in filling perhaps some of those gaps? So thank you, Sarah, and good morning to all of you. Um, I think the basis of this uh, next generation plan is now a very important one because uh, contrary to um, previous efforts, which were mainly focused uh, on the question of uh, tax and production subsidiary, subsidies, this new plan is very much focused on investments. And um, in a way to say, look, we combine economic growth and decarbonization through investment. So that is, I think, a very important basis where also um, companies um, and certainly large uh, investors, uh, such as AXA, for example, can really participate. And um, the second uh, element uh, that is very important that uh, Feike mentioned um, is that we want to be extremely concrete. So um, uh, concrete actions, concrete um, uh, commitments of the companies. And I'll give you an example. Um, when we look at uh, a large insurer, uh, we need to invest a lot of money. And uh, we've been, uh, from the very beginning, very active uh, when it came to the climate transition. So we were the first ones to get out of coal. Um, this uh, topic is more or less sorted out. Um, we are now very active uh, in the area of uh, green bonds. And if you look um, at uh, the next generation uh, uh, plan, 30% of the investment uh, is in green deal, uh, is in green uh, bonds, which um, is a great way to bridge uh, the gap between uh, the sustainable uh, transition and uh, the projects. And um, for AXA, for example, we said that we want to increase um, our uh, green uh, investments in green bonds um, up to 24 billion by 2023. 
which was very difficult uh, in the beginning because obviously you have to convince um, the uh, investment teams that this is uh, as sustainable uh, as uh, other investments that they used to do. But um, I see this as a very pragmatic uh, way of doing it. Um, what is important though, and coming back also to the question around um, how can uh, public and um, private work together, it's very important uh, to have the right framework. So when we talk about green, the definition of green, the uh, criteria for what is green, what is not green, needs to be uh, rock solid, needs to be well defined. I think there is still some work to be done. Um, and certainly when it comes to um, policy items uh, such as uh, financial disclosures around uh, energy transition, financial disclosures around um, stranded technologies. Um, this needs to be uh, more enforced. I think the basis uh, of all of uh, this is there today. Um, the public domain should really push more in enforcing it. Uh, but I feel today, uh, and certainly uh, FICA um, mirrored this as well in our joint uh, groups with, group with the 30 companies, there is a lot of desire, a lot of willingness to contribute um, with very concrete actions. And um, by creating the right framework um, in the uh, governmental and uh, political arena, and by uh, enticing the uh, companies to really invest and um, make uh, the energy transition a core part of their strategy and not anymore uh, a checkbook uh, part of a corporate social responsibility. I think those are the two elements uh, with which we can really concretely uh, move on and make the two um, pieces work uh, even better together. And you've called for other CEOs, other business leaders also to join you in that initiative. So it's very much an open invitation. Um, I'd like to turn right now to the minister from the Netherlands, Minister Van uh, Veldhoven. And um, I mean, perhaps our, our audience here would have noticed that we have two representatives from the Netherlands um, on this, this kickoff uh, session. I mean, that really tells us, first of all, something about um, how pressing the climate emergency is for your country. Um, and also, you know, the track record that you have in dealing with it, the track record that you have in action, including a historic agreement bringing public and private closer together. Um, perhaps you'd just like to kick us off to tell us what lessons have been learned. Um, and also maybe people might be interested to know you're going somewhere as well. And it has to do a little with this conversation also. Facility with His Majesty the King it's a new company that is going to ensure that, that um, uh, certain metals that had to be uh, landfilled are now completely regenerated and can be used again, creating jobs for about 40 people uh, and, and avoiding a waste stream. Um, so excuse me therefore for being underway, our sun is not too uh, reflecting screens, um, but let me pick up really stretch. First of all, the point that Faga made, is that we need to learn and understand the need to avoid such disruptive periods for our economies and our societies. We should really learn from this COVID crisis to, to, to increase the urgency that we never want to have this kind of an impact again and that we should avoid climate change to have this kind of an impact. It needs to be inclusive and indeed we need investments. And if we need a reset, then there's one big point that I'd really like to stress. And that is that we need to look beyond the energy if we want to attain the Paris Agreement goals. A recent study by Ellen MacArthur uh, raised the fact that 45% of all our CO2 emissions are related to the production of goods and food. So if, we, if AXA is disinvesting in coal, that is fantastic. But we need to look beyond the energy side to the circular economy side. There's lots of low hang hanging fruit. There's lots of waste to be avoided costs to be avoided. And this is a great agenda to work on with industry. I think we really need indeed in the Green Deal to make this link between the contribution the economy can make to achieving our Paris Agreement goals. So what do we need in the Green Deal? I think uh, like uh, some of the private sector uh, partners have said, raised ambition. Uh, so of course, a very happy with the Commissioner President uh, to raise the ambition to at least 55%. We need to set targets to give business a very clear reason to innovate 
And we need to put our money where our mouth is and support those targets and support that innovation with money under the Green Deal, with the resilience and recovery funds, et cetera. So, and we also need to start rewarding cutting CO2 through the circular economy. I think for too long we have seen, let's say, the climate change and the, and the CO2 reduction as something separate from the circular economy, but there's all kinds of links. And basically I'd like to say it's the C, stupid, need carbon, we need the right combination with all of us. So our quest should be to put it to better use, to ensure that we drive in a CO2 neutral way, and this will generate a whole lot of new investments in all kinds of sectors. In the Netherlands, we've set up a government-wide program addressing all sectors, but not top-down. We're doing this with the business sector, and we ask them to identify where the barriers are, where the opportunities are, and what we can do to help them. Uh, and so far, we are, uh, well, it, it turns out that we, we turn out to be a, a leading country uh, in achieving some of those goals, but we still have a long, long way to go. And we can only do that if we work together, at least on a European scale, because the Netherlands wants to be 100% circular, but it's an illusion that we could ever do that alone. We need European cooperation and we need worldwide cooperation on all of those important and long international trade routes. That's what I'd like to, to say as a starter of this, uh, this discussion. Fantastic, thank you. So um, a lot of progress, but still a lot of work to be done. Minister Gonzalez, Absolutely. I'd like to turn to you again. Um, and perhaps to just also, you know, put this in the broader perspective, um, perhaps we can just reflect for a moment before we continue the conversation, um, because we have heard the commission president, Ursula von der Leyen saying that this is Europe's man on the moon moment. I mean, it is really this pioneering action also that Professor Schwab has referred to. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you have other international actors, for example, this past week, China also announcing that they would target net zero by 2060. You have the US withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord. What is your impression right now when you look at the international power play? And how do you see the importance for the EU to lead when it comes to setting the pace of a green recovery? Well, certainly uh, the European Union is leading uh, with the example. Not only is the EU uh, advancing this as a strategic objective, but it's also showing that it can do it, that it's committed to doing it, uh, that we are advancing uh, in decarbonizing our economy, that we are advancing a more circular economy, that, and that in this process, we are making our economies more competitive. This is not about choosing between uh, protecting climate or um, um, giving an impulse to our economies. It's not about choosing between the two. It's about ensuring our economies become more competitive in a more sustainable manner. This is a very important message that has been heard in some parts of the world. Uh, and this is why we are seeing countries come up uh, with uh, commitments. Uh, to uh, decarbonization. The last one we heard was from the Chinese president. I think it was an important moment uh, in uh, this week uh, discussions in the UN General Assembly because it shows that China now has finally embraced this idea that it can decarbonize uh, while again making its economy stronger. We still have a bit of uh, work to do in other parts of the world, but at the, at the heart of uh, what we have to explain and understand is that in a more interdependent world, it's incumbent on, upon all of us to make the efforts towards decarbonization, that it will not work if some major economies simply do not do it, and that it would help every major economy if it, it did embark uh, on uh, this effort uh, to uh, boost the economy while protecting um, uh, our planet. This is the message that Europe is giving. This is the priority that uh, Europe uh, is has for itself. And this is the ambition uh, that Europe will advance internationally, uh, simply because in this more interdependent world, we all need uh, to make our efforts towards uh, this uh, planet that uh, our children and grandchildren will inherit, so we owe it to them. It's important to remember that that broader context and what is really at stake here. So thank you so much, 
um, for that, Minister Gonzalez. And um, perhaps you might have seen, if you've been looking at your screen in the past couple of minutes, you keep getting this pop-up, which says that breakout sessions will start shortly. Um, indeed, there are three breakout sessions starting shortly. And FICA, I know you're going to um, observe one of those and provide the conclusions for that one. That is the public private cooperation to accelerate the European Green Deal agenda. There's also one on financial tools and policies for green recovery and tech and innovation and R&D for a green Europe. This is really the action part of our session. This, this is also um, where we really drill down specifically into these public private partnerships and, and what is possible and what we might be able to come out of this conversation. So therefore in that context, I would like to ask each of you and I'll begin with FICA. Um, what should people keep in mind when they're going into these sessions? What is the top thing that you think participants should have top of mind and have as their goals? Well, thank you. And thanks for uh, moderating. Uh, well, nobody can do this alone. I, I, I'm very pleased with uh, Professor Swart, together with also, of course, uh, President von Neyer, setting the scene uh, of all of this. Uh, I'm very pleased with uh, front runner ministers like Minister Gonzalez and Minister van Veldhuis, who it's a felt of who's really uh, setting the scene here from a country uh, perspective. But we need the help of business as well, because they have the innovation, they have the, the tools to do that. Supported by investors like Thomas is doing, shifting his investments can really have a big impact. I would say keep the following seven points in mind. Europe needs to be climate neutral by 2050. How can we do that? We need to put us on a path of sustainability and also becoming resilient towards next pandemics, which we saw coming climate change. Thirdly, make it fair and inclusive. The ministers mentioned it also. That means also reskilling of people, moving them to another job, using the power of innovation and technologies, which can bring also prosperity to the future of the companies. Put a price on carbon, think about carbon offsetting, which can stimulate. Like Sintje van Veldhuis said, Circular economy, redesigning our value chains could be very, very important. And last but not least, transparency. Be open about your emissions, your reductions, your plans, and the financial consequences. And if we were concrete in that domain, I think we can make a huge impact and a huge change. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Faika. And Thomas, your thoughts, please. I mean, we, we are here today with, you know, members of the, the, the private, the public sector. Perhaps there's something that you might like to see more of from the public sector. I mean, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm very focused on uh, the fact that um, the investment uh, really flows into the right direction. And um, the question around green bonds um, is something that is extremely important. Um, we need to get this right. As I said earlier, this is 30 percent um, of the investment volume that requires um, the alignment between public and private um, around a couple of topics. Um, one is the question what are the characteristics of these uh, projects? I mean, we have international standards um, for uh, normal investments. Should we not, uh, uh, you know, basically transfer them to the logic of green bonds or do we need to reinvent it? That I think is something very important. The second topic um, is really the question around um, uh, what is green, what is not green? How do we get uh, a clarification around the classification? And then the third element uh, is for me very much a practical one. Um, do the forums that exist today, are they sufficient uh, for this dialogue between public and private? Or do we need to think about a different way of how we uh, get public and private together, especially on this question around the green bond and the green bond financing to quickly get to a result uh, which allows us then also to make the necessary investment because um, as we said earlier, time is short and the pressure is high. What might that different way look like, you think? Give us some food for thought. No, to, today, for example, th those uh, we are we are working uh, very much apart. So, if you take um, a very concrete example, the uh, the taxonomy. Um, if you take the example of the uh, TCFD, so the Task Force for Financial Disclosure, uh, these elements have mostly been created or in the process of being created, but uh, it often happens too much in silos. 
And the question is, how can we come together? How can we get to a better dialogue to develop them together? Because um, basically, we always talk about customer orientation. And the question is that the investor, in this case, who is the customer, needs to also give his or her input very early on to make sure that those uh, policy frameworks actually work going forward and come to the right uh, aim. And um, this is, for me, the topic, how can we get together more? How can we speed up in a co-development rather than in this traditional process of, I suggest something, I wait for feedback, and it, it takes very long. Okay, we're going to get the ministers to respond short, uh, to that one. Uh, very short uh, addition. Uh, some people said, is this now in the COVID period to focus? Let's have a look that there are two airports, Schiphol Airport, Heathrow Airport, joining the group of Thomas and me. Uh, they are really under pressure in their business, those airports, as you can imagine. And they join this group because they see this as a way for their future. And that's interesting that those people join as well. Fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Um, Minister van Veldhoven, your thoughts? Well, what I'd really like you to consider in the, in the work in the sessions is that we really need to link climate change and the circular economy. Because if we don't, we're not just neglect, neglecting half of the problem, we're also neglecting half of the solutions. And there are many solutions for different growth in different ecosystems. And I think it's for every company to decide what kind of a company am I, where is my place in this ecosystem, but let's not ignore half of the solutions. It's a very optimistic agenda. And so as, um, as all of this work is also very much about us being there as people, I'd also like to urge for urgency and optimism because a lot can be done and we can manage this. So I really hope that that will be the spirit also in breakout sessions. Minister Gonzalez. Well, for me, there is a big theme in here, which is uh, multilateral cooperation to build global resilience. So how do we, uh, how do we uh, get more uh, countries uh, to behave in a more cooperative manner uh, to build more resilience? At the end of the day, uh, what we've learned with the pandemic is that the name of the game is building resilience uh, for the future. So how do we do that in a more cooperative manner would be a theme uh, that, in my view, would, would be worth uh, looking into a, a bit more detail. Would you, would you like to perhaps respond to anything that Thomas also proposed there? Oh, I think uh, all the, uh, I very much uh, agree that uh, um, uh, involving uh, the uh, suspects that might be a bit unusual in this discussion, uh, like uh, airports, uh, who have understood that this is also, they can be also part of the solution, is reaching out to those parts of the business that may not have uh, understood that this is also about them and that they can also be part of this resilience building and find an opportunity to do business. At the end of the day, again, this theme that uh, you don't have to, uh, this is not about uh, uh, not uh, uh, giving an impulse to the economy, but impulsing the economy in a different way, in a significantly transformed way. That this uh, may be also um, what I would say. But very much agree with uh, what my colleagues uh, in the panel have said. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. Um, I believe Professor Schwab is actually still with us. Um, I hope I might be so bold actually as to, to, to ask him to weigh in and also to give us um, some, some wise words before we head into the breakout session because we've been examining the central question um, throughout this kickoff conversation. As Europe moves from managing the COVID-19 pandemic, implementing the systemic changes needed to rebuild the economy, create jobs, restore trust, how can business and government use the European Green Deal to make the region greener, more competitive, more inclusive? Um, we have our action-oriented breakout sessions coming up now. Professor Schwab, what would you like to see? No, just two, two uh, comments. The first one is, I think it's very important that everything we are doing uh, as business leaders is not just seen as a reach out uh, for social purposes, but it is integrated into the big ideological change which we have moving from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. So we have to make sure that those efforts are understood as something which is natural. Uh, so second point, and here I, I uh, take up what uh, Thomas said, uh, our concern 
uh, and we discussed it in our board of trustees, is a profileration of activities. I think we see a, good, a lot of goodwill of um, the business community. I'm, I'm um, uh, grateful that we see action group for the Green Deal. We have some kind of a vehicle, but I, we have to make sure that we create really powerful, if we want to work together as business leaders with governments, that we create powerful alliances and coalitions. So it's not uh, departmentalized, but it's an integrated approach. Back to you, Sarah. And thank you, by the way, for guiding us so well uh, through the first part of this discussion.